So, yeah, so as I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Nita will be joining us from a car. He's driving in Italy at the moment. So um, he'll be connecting momentarily. And um, let's see, I just wanted to start out our meeting today to say that uh, Dr. Nita and I will be having another uh, Zoom meeting that we'll be holding together probably when we're both in Italy next month. Um, and that will be kind of another another very open one. But we knew that there were a lot of you who have already signed up for the Tibet and the Bhutan trip who are eager to get an update about everything from visa applications to travel arrangements. So we will, in this meeting, uh, be focusing a bit more on practicalities uh, for the coming journeys. Uh, and as we did last time, at the same time, we will also talk in more general terms about what the two trips will be covering. But uh, in a certain sense, as Dr. Need and I discussed yesterday, we'll be this will be kind of the looking at the outer aspects of the trip. And then uh, what we'll do next month is we'll have another meeting where we cover more the the inner aspects of the journey. In other words, looking at the the kind of content of practice uh, that will be of core to both the Tibet and Mount Kailash journey, as well as the Bhutan journey. But just uh, because we, we've sent some updates to everyone who has signed up already, uh, but we thought this might be a good occasion to to just address some very specific concerns and then also to to open it up more to questions and answers. So, yeah, I'm just seeing a link here. A Russian translation will be available. That's in the chat. Uh, so while Dr. Nita joins, uh, just looking for that, um, I'll just send him a quick message. So just to give an introduction, because I see a lot of names here, people who haven't... Uh, actually weren't here present on the last Zoom call that we had. So just to give you a general introduction to Vajrapath's offerings in terms of journeys in 2024, uh, as you may know, we have the journey to Tibet and Mount Kailash, the sacred mountain at the center of the Buddhist universe. Uh, and this is a mountain that is sacred to the tantric Buddhist deity, um, Chakrasamvara, the Wheel of Bliss, and thus the title for the trip, the Wheel of Bliss. And uh, Chakrasamvara is depicted as being on the summit of uh, Mount Kailash in union with Vajravarahi, Vajrayogini, consort. And so it's actually this kind of, this, this very, very dynamic energy, uh, which is central to the sacrality of the mountain and it's essentially for for hindus it's um it's shiva and shakti on the summit and we can see a lot and as we will explore during the course of that journey looking at the direct links between the chakra samvara tantra in particular and pre-existing uh, hindu shaiva tantras so in other words shiva and shakti chakra samvara vajavarahi a lot of common ground both iconographically as well as in terms of the internal practices connected with with those deities, and at the same time, you know, all, exploring all of this in the context of this extraordinary um, mountain, as it's described as a kind of ladder between heaven and earth, at the center of the earth. So, a really an amazing place, an amazing journey. And then, when we have the the Bhutan trip in um, uh, in October, we'll be looking at kind of the completion stage practices of Chakrasambara, in other words, the tumo, the inner heat practices, working with bliss and heat, and, uh, heat energy in the body, which is, as the, the as people are aware, I think, uh, in the Vajrayana Tantric Buddhist tradition, we have the so-called creation stage and completion stage. And the creation stage, working with active imagination, working with, in other words, an altered uh, view of reality that uh, works with the um, extraordinary iconography of the Tibetan and Tantric Buddhist traditions. And then we work with the energy practices to bring those um, practices to their fullest realization in Mahamudra and Dzogchen. So the offerings of uh, the 2024 
Vajra Path journeys are going to be working right through the creation stage, the completion stage, and then culminating essentially in the um, the final. Um, one second, I have to um, go back to. It's asking for language here. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of the general plan for this year working through the creation, completion, and great perfection stages of the Tantric Buddhist path. And that will be, in a sense, on both trips, both the, the Tibet to Mount Kailash trip as well as Bhutan. Of course, the trips will be, each one will be a kind of uh, culmination, leading in from one to the other. Um, but at the same time, all of those aspects will be covered on both of the journeys. So uh, we know that it's not realistic for most of you to be able to come on both trips, although we would obviously encourage that and we're going to be actually making an arrangement in future and it would actually be apl applicable this time if you wanted to come on both trips we're going to try to make a special arrangement where there's a reduced cost for for the trips if you choose to participate in both so if you have questions about that if you're in a position to potentially come on both trips just email us at the vajra path uh, gmail.com and we'll we'll explain um about that policy, which we'll also be uh, introducing on the Vajra Path website, which we hope to launch already from next week. And that will include uh, information uh, that we'll be covering today, for example. Uh, a lot of the what you've seen so far about the trips in terms of trip prospectuses, trip logistics, uh, preparation packing guidelines, conceptual, as well as practical overviews of the trips we're going to have a lot of that up on the website so we're excited about that that will also include some of the the preparatory uh and follow-up online retreats that we'll be offering so uh there's a lot sort of happening behind the scenes that we're very excited to to share with you very soon um i wanted again if dr nita i don't know are you there nita, yeah i do see dr nita can you if you're there and could you uh, yes, yes. I'm in the car traveling. Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. Okay, great, great, great. Yes, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah. I think, no. yeah, perfect. You start to give information and answer the questions. Okay, And very good. I will mute myself, yeah, if there will be any questions, I will answer later, yeah? Sure, sure. I'm great. in the car. Okay, great, yeah. Thank perfect. you. Hi, yeah. everyone. Nice to meet you <laughs> again here. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so as I said, well, this is a kind of the outer... Uh, introduction again to to the the Kailash and Mount and uh, Tibet trips as well as the Bhutan trips and Dr. Nita and I will do together a kind of focusing more on the inner content of both trips uh, when we're both in Italy next next month um, and in this regard I know there have been a lot of questions that people have asked and I'll just cover this briefly because we will send an email to you all about it about the the visa process for applying for a China visa. It's become more kind of uh, bureaucratic uh, in since COVID. And so the policy now is to get a China visa. Uh, you have to be formally invited with an official uh, itinerary uh, from the Chinese, from a, China, a registered Chinese government um, tour agency. So we, we work with a partner agency in uh, Chengdu in China. And we've sent everybody's PDFs of everybody's uh, passport photos and they've just been waiting they want to wait until the kind of group is formed before they send the um the the official invitation letters that will have your name and passport number on it and you would simply uh print out that um uh that letter that formal letter which will have an itinerary for china in it so don't don't be concerned when you see that the itinerary doesn't include tibet this is just the normal two-part staged process by which visas and travel in Tibet uh, take place. So you'll have a, um, an initial letter with an initial itinerary, uh, and you will follow, just submit that when you apply for your, for your China visa, and we will give you all the instructions for that in an email. So no worries, that all can happen very quickly once, um, once the letters are issued, which they said will happen this coming week now that we've pretty much filled uh, the trip. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. Also, uh, on the earlier 
uh, trip prospectuses that you've all received. We talk about early morning flights from Chengdu to Lhasa, as well as our flights back. We, we didn't give you specific information about it. Um, we will be sending out again to everybody who's fully registered. That information uh, will be included in an updated trip prospectus. But just if you wanted to take note of that, because I know some people were trying to book their flights in and out of Chengdu, for example. And uh, so just if you've taken note of that, our, our uh, on the 27th of July, our flight will be, it's a Tibetan Tibet Airlines flight leaving at uh, 9 a.m. It's approximately two and a half hour flight to Lhasa. We arrive around noon. And then on the 13th of August, we fly out at 9.20 and arrive in Chengdu at 11.30. So with 11.30 allowing for potentially a half an hour delay or so, it could be more, it would be very safe uh, for those of you who have asked to book a flight out from Chengdu on the 13th of August, anytime, I would say from, from uh, 3 p.m. onward. That allows for more than three hours of um, transit time in Chengdu. So you can consider that. Also, most of the flights from... Uh, from Lhasa to Chengdu, continue on to Beijing. So if you have a flight uh, that uh, goes from Beijing, then uh, then uh, that can be taken into account as well. Although we did just get the update that for the people who would be uh, wanting to travel via Beijing, that uh, it would be a different, we, we all have to travel on the same flight in from Chengdu, but uh, there's another, there's a direct flight on the uh, the 13th of August uh, that arrives. I forget exactly what time, but we'll send all that all out in an email. So if your international flight is going to go through through Beijing uh, on the way out, then uh, you might you'd get a different flight out from Lhasa. So those are just some practical considerations. Also for Bhutan, we have also the specific flights that will be booked on. Uh, again, to take note, we'll send that out, but uh, essentially, we did want to clarify something that some people had asked about because the flights from Bangkok to Paro go earlier in the morning, 6.30 in the morning from uh, from Bangkok and arrive in uh, just before 10 o'clock in the morning in Paro, uh, whereas the flight from Delhi leaves only at 1.30 in the afternoon and gets in after 4 p.m. Uh, that day. So what we put on the itinerary, which is the visit to um the Kichu Monastery, the oldest monastery in uh, Bhutan, some people were very concerned that, um, you know, if they came in on the Delhi flight, that they wouldn't see that temple. Um, but we have made a provision where we would see that, in fact, on um, when we fly back from Bumtang, from Jakar and Bumtang, and we get back to Paro, for those who didn't get to see it on that day, the first day, if they were flying in from, from Delhi, we make sure that you're able to, to visit it on that day. It's a very short drive from where we'll be staying, and we can easily fit that in uh, on that day. So those are just some general questions that have come up and which we will uh, send you emails about. But since there are a lot of new people here who haven't been with us for the earlier Zoom calls, uh, we'd be very happy this time just to take some questions that any of you might have um, that we didn't just cover now um, on any aspects of either of the two trips. So please um, please unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat and we'll be happy to, to answer. I'll just go for it instead of typing. Yes. Hi, please. Delaney here. Um, so I have a lot of surface level knowledge of things and you've given a lot of reading materials there. Is, is it still going to be okay like if you don't have a lot of knowledge? Great, great. Delini, that's a really important question. So thanks for asking it. Yeah, no, all of our Vajrapath trips, we, you know, it's very specifically, although we go right to the core essence of the Tantric Buddhist tradition and Vajrayana, we don't have a situation where you know there's any prerequisites per se, at least not for these journeys. We very much, the idea of them is that they're kind of a crash course, as it were, uh, introducing Vajrayana, Tantric Buddhism, through sacred places, 
both from the Vajrayana tradition as well as analogous traditions. So we did a trip, for example, in Greece last year, looking at the the mystery school traditions of of, uh, of ancient Greece and how they have common elements with what we see in Vajrayana. So in that respect, you shouldn't be concerned that um, you know you don't have the requisite background. We'll be giving you you know, suggested readings and things like that. But really, we will be very conscious right from the outset on the trip to give more introductory talks and uh, so that people really have a thorough grounding both in the theory and practice of Vajrayana as we, as we undertake these journeys. Great. Any other questions? Hello, Ian. Hello there. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you for this. My question is simply, as far as staying on, you had mentioned something about, of course, staying on in Tibet itself is not an option. But there were some areas you were talking about, if one wanted to extend the trip beyond. Uh, yes. So for the Tibet trip, some people have asked whether they could come early or, or go later. Again, it's quite strict now in, uh, in Tibet and China generally. One can only travel in as a group and one is expected to travel out as a group. But there's a lot of Tibetan, there's parts of Tibet that are in Sichuan province, which is where Chengdu is located. And we can um, we'll gen de uh, definitely be able to advise some... Um, some possible ways of staying on in the Tibetan Buddhist world uh, where after we've flown out of what's called the Tibetan Autonomous Region, R, where we need to have separate permits and can only travel as a group. Uh, so it all depends on how much time you'd want to spend. Uh, and um, you know, before we'd know how to advise that there are places, for example, that you could fly to uh, in Sichuan or Yunnan, for example, that are fantastically interesting mm. and worth visiting like in uh even the uh, it, it the original Gyaltang, uh which is in southeastern tibet it's been re renamed shangri-la because of its beauty and its uh, and its quality so there's that's a place one can get easy flights to from chengdu if you wanted to mm. go there it's a wonderful place to spend a few days um and we'll put together a list i mean even there you know dali Places again where there were other forms of Vajrayana Buddhism, uh, with the Bai, the Bai people, the Bai tradition, uh, really beautiful places, um, and where a lot of the tea in Tibet was always imported from is on the what was called the tea trail. So we can recommend a lot of those for people who want to perhaps stay longer in the region, uh, but outside of the Tibet Autonomous Region itself. So we'll, we'll put together a little, uh, some information on that and uh, get that to you as well as put it on the, on the website. Oh, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and oh, the other yeah. <laughs> I am. So my understanding is that you can fly directly from uh, Lhasa to Beijing because, you know, I'm going to uh, fly international. So, um, we can make arrangements, right, for that to fly directly from Lhasa to Beijing and then leave Beijing, you know, because it'd be a lot easier, obviously. Yes, that's very possible. And I actually had that information, but uh, I don't have immediate access to it. Sure. But yeah, it's a different flight on the on on the day that we would leave Tibet on the seventh of um, um no, sorry, on the uh, the thirteenth. Yeah, on yeah. the thirteenth, and yeah, I forget what time it arrives in Lhasa, but I'll be sending we'll be sending that information out to everyone who's 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 booked on it. But it does mean when you're coming in, as a lot of flights will through Beijing, but we really do need to arrive by the uh, the twenty sixth of July in Chengdu, so that we all meet at the airport essentially uh, by seven thirty a.m. because we have a flight at. Uh, at nine o'clock that morning. So actually even better, probably we should be meeting at the airport around seven. We'll give precise information about that and where we meet, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we've done this many times before, so it's pretty straightforward, but um, but it does mean that you'll need to spend the night of the 26th uh, in Chengdu. And as we wrote before, we'll have some recommended hotels, some of which are very close to the airport and some of which if you're gonna spend more than a night or two, in Chengdu are, are 
like the Buddha Zen is a really fun hotel in a very interesting old part of the city, uh, very close to a, a beautiful old Zen monastery. So, but those are, you know, they're almost an hour from the airport because you're in the heart of the old city then. But we will give a number of recommended hotels, both ones in the vicinity of um, the airport as well as in the inner city. And then you can look at your situation and choose which ones you, you want to stay at. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ian? Yeah. Hi, it's Wendy. Hi, How Wendy. are you? Yeah, hi. good. Good. I have a couple questions. Um, mm -hmm. So, so um, not to be timid or anything, but, you know, I'd be a single woman dra uh, traveling alone to Chengdu, and I just wanted to know your thoughts on um, precautions or safety or something I should be aware of. Um, is it okay, you know, like generally speaking, pretty easy for someone like me if I come in early? Yes. From my experience, it's very, very safe, very easy to, to get around. Um, it's, yeah, it's a very, yeah, there's no issues of safety that way that any, that I've experienced or, or heard of or witnessed as, and many, many people who've come on previous trips with us have also found it very, very accommodating and uh, yeah, with no no difficulty at all. So um, yeah, not not to worry that way really. And also some of the, you know, the hotels around, they're all very accommodating and um, yeah, shouldn't be, shouldn't be a problem. But again, we'll get you some more precise information uh, about how to manage when you do arrive in, uh, in Chengdu, you know, how to get to your hotel and and, and all of that, but it really should be very straightforward. Okay. And, and, very, and, very and my safe. second, yep. mm -hmm. safe. Okay, great. Um, and the second question I have um, is about phones. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, um, you know, bringing a phone that could also act as a camera. Would it be better for me to get a brand new phone? I, I maybe somebody here has this experience because I probably can't use the phone I've got because there's too much on there that would be um, maybe kind of Dharma related that mm -hmm. would not be a great idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a time in the past, you know, where one had to be cautious. For example, one couldn't travel with books in Tibet that had forwards by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, because then they'd be confiscated and one would suddenly be seen as a splittist, as they were called. Um, so one should be cautious about, um, uh, dharma books like that but we're not in any way likely to be uh in a search situations where we're going to have our bags examined or looked at i've had a lot of that before in tibet because i've traveled in very remote and unusual places like pemaku uh where it's quite often that one is um investigated that way but where we're traveling is all standard places where where tourists are allowed and travel so we have and i've never had on any trip to kailash anything uh no issues like that whatsoever so i don't think you should be concerned about what's on your iphone um you just want to make sure that you have enough space on your phone uh for the photos you want to take and then also in terms of phones um often people have taken as i do uh an old iphone or an old old mobile phone of any kind, and then you can get a local uh, mobile Chinese mobile number, and then they kind of work really well. They work everywhere, and they cost almost nothing. And it's like having a walkie-talkie. You know, you can communicate with anybody in the group, with any of the guides, just using a local, um, uh, just for domestic, you know, domestic calls within China, Tibet, and that's been that's very simple. The other advantage of that is that then you can use that iPhone or that extra phone as a hotspot uh, because you'll have that signal and that would allow your normal phone, which might still just have your US number on it to get a Wi-Fi signal through your hotspot. And that would allow you to you know, have WhatsApp communication, allow you to receive emails, et cetera. So, it, but now as I understand it, and I haven't explored it fully yet, but I'm sure a lot of people have, there now have eSIMs um and i don't know enough about it but it's something to look into because then you have a lot more flexibility you don't actually have to have this separate sim any longer i'm not sure what the process is 
uh, whether it works in China, Tibet or not. But it's something we'll also look into because that way you can have several so-called eSIMs in your phone simultaneously, uh, allowing you uh, seemingly uh, Wi-Fi access as long as you have data. But um, the safer way, and what I've always used on every trip to Tibet, is just to bring an old phone and uh, put a local a local Chinese SIM card in it. And uh, then I have Wi-Fi and I have a local number the whole the whole way through. And that can be very useful because we'll have that signal all the way around Kailash. And uh, that allows us, you know, if somebody straying behind, you know, can reach them. Uh, and it just gives a lot more... Uh, connectivity within the group uh, to have it that way. It's not like everybody has to have it, but um, it's good if you're around somebody who does, just just in case there's communication issues to be taken into account. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Regarding yeah. these two informations. Sorry? So, okay. Yeah, regarding these two informations, the safety, now it's very safe. Every 200 meters, there's a CCTV. <laughs> so that's... Okay. Uh, yeah. Actually, especially big cities, everything is super guarded. Yeah, yeah. And so, so there's no really now this uh, safety issues. That's uh, right. very safe. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, yes, as you said, the SIM card, the local one. Probably we are going to oh, everybody have a WeChat. WeChat is the the local communication tool. We mm. can make a temporary WeChat because uh, everybody should know in China not allowed to use WhatsApp and Gmail. And as Wendy was asking, so it, the best thing is if you need to communicate with your family members, don't use Gmail. Because if you use Gmail from China and you use VPN or, you know, anything special internet, you use a Gmail. And it seems very often they, they, they control Gmail very strictly. And then probably they check your old Gmails and if you have any, you know, contact with, uh, I don't know, anything with really political issues, then maybe they, they cause some troubles. Mm -hmm. So what we need to remember is uh, in, while we are in Tibet, we cannot use WhatsApp and the Gmail. These two are forbidden. Yep. That's, yeah. that's really, really critical advice. And WeChat, which... Um we'll all be able to easily use when we're there because the only signing up for WeChat's not always easy because you have to have somebody who already has it and then you um then you automatically get the um the link. So we'll uh, be doing I think I think yeah we can organize a group WeChat because then you know mm -hmm. as a group I think the travel agency can help us. We all make Absolutely. a WeChat together. Yep. And then like that we can easily then, do it over there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And also, uh, if you need to maintain the communication with your family members, so, you know, WeChat, you can download anywhere, also in the, you know, U.S. and other countries. Mm -hmm. So if you, are, if you suggest your family members, they have a WeChat, and then you will have the WeChat in then yeah. that will be the perfect communication. You know, then, of course, if you open a new WeChat, your communication with your family members, also, it's a new chat, right? yeah that's that's critical advice and very very important and so this the same way um if people Use have a, yeah yeah because google is a google is an issue in um in exactly Canada. yeah yeah so anyway it's good we have a wechat uh sorry it's good we have whatsapp group now because that's relevant overall for the Vajra path going forward. And of course, it's essential in, in Bhutan where there's no issue like that. But certainly just for just for the group going to uh, going to Tibet, once we get there, we'll create that, uh, that WeChat group. But if you can download it before that and share it with your family members, then they'll be able to stay in touch with you that way relatively easily uh, while you're in, um, in Tibet. So, yeah. And if you also have once we're there, we'll have pretty much email connectivity, you know, maybe just two days uh, on uh, going around Kailash will be the only time when we don't. Well, there'll be a couple nights, too, when we're camping where we won't have, uh, except if you have a hotspot and can use it. Uh, but there'll be a, you know occasional periods, nights at a time when may not have uh, regular email contact. But if you have an alternate email account, for example, then 
that would be a very good to to um, resurrect that and use that during the time that we're in Tibet. Good. Other questions? A lot of silence. <laughs> I'll break that I'll break, silence. I'll break, I'll break. <laughs> um, so what would the inner work look like on the journeys? I guess more what specifically for me, I'm asking for Bhutan, but I guess it's relevant for everyone's journey. I'm sorry, what would what look like? I, I didn't hear it fully, your question. The inner work look like. Oh, the inner work. Well, certainly, <laughs> yes. The inner work, we will be... we. We will have a schedule uh, for uh, the inner work, as I mentioned, for the, the Kailash trip is with a, a kind of overall focus on the Chakra Sambara Tantra. It's one of the earliest so-called Yogini Tantras in the Tantric Buddhist tradition. Very, very rich in terms of its iconography, the whole history of its formation and development. Uh, Chakra Sambara, meaning literally the, the wheels of bliss. So it's very, very much centered on the on the the yogic body or the subtle body in terms of the the chakra system the flows of energy within the body that's really what chakra samvara represents in its multiple hands the whole dyadic representation of it it has all of the core practices of vajrayana buddhism are encoded in the chakra samvara tantra so we'd be starting that trip with uh, introducing you all to you could say the history and development and emergence of the Chakra Sambara Tantra, its importance within Vajrayana as a whole, being one of the most important of those early Buddhist, uh, Tantric Buddhist Tantras. And then uh, we would look at the, uh, Dr. Nita has this very special transmission of the, um, of the Chakra Sambara Tantra, the, because they're different, they're different uh, lineages of Chakra Sambara. So what we always do with the Vajra with the Vajra path is to try to introduce you to the most core, vital, uh, essential uh, transmission. So Dr. Nita will be will be offering that, and we will uh, have the core practice of the creation stage of the Vajra of the the um, uh, Chakras of our Tantra, kind of as the fundamental basis for for what we do, and that includes. Uh, not just mantra practice and visualization, but it also includes a lot of energy work. And that's, of course, preparatory to to the presentation of Tumo and the Karma Mudra. All of those are aspects of the Chakra Samvara Tantra. So we'll be looking at the full spectrum of this wheel of bliss, which is basically a model for our own psychophysical anatomy and our own true nature. Uh, so every aspect of Vajrayana Tantric Buddhism is encoded within Chakra Samvara. So we'll be looking at that in the context, particularly as we work with with, Vajra, with uh, the Vajra path. When we will spend three nights in Lhasa, we go to various temples, monasteries, including the, the Lukang Temple, the Dalai Lama's so-called you know, secret temple, um, which has these extraordinary murals uh, of Dzogchen, but also including all of the, uh, the the preceding six yogas of Naropa, or they're all there. So all of the way we work with these journeys is we introduce these core practices in the context of the sacred places where they would have been practiced. So it's always very situational. And this goes really back to the way that Vajrayana was transmitted and taught uh, prior to really being institutionalized and codified in a in a more general way, we work very much situ with the situation, and in the situation means in the context of these journeys, the sacred places that are fundamental to uh, to our itinerary. So in Lhasa, for example, the temple of the Six Dalai Lama will be crucial. Um, also, we'll see many murals in the the Potala Palace of the Dalai Lamas that will also speak to these traditions. So you'll be getting uh, a sense of the evolution uh, of the traditions through the sacred places uh, they're connected with. Uh, we'll also be going to other um, key places in Lhasa before we continue on to some of the greatest monasteries that were ever uh, developed in, in Tibet, like in Gyanse. There's a, at the uh, Pelkorchede, monastery 
an extraordinary temple dedicated to the 84 Mahasiddhas, the male and female adepts whose were in which the Chakrasambara Tantra was central to their practice. And there's actually a great three-dimensional mandala of Chakrasambara there. So we'll see, again, the teachings will be presented in the context of the living iconography and living traditions and landscapes connected to, to the tradition. And that will continue in Shigatse, and obviously it will become fundamental when we reach Mount Kailash, which is a living mandala of Chakrasambara. So as we circumambulate the mountain, we're also inscribing a mandala, both outwardly and inwardly and, and secretly, and their practices that are that are done in that process, which is a symbolic death and rebirth process. So um, the teachings will be given according to as is often described in the Vajrayama tradition, the person, the place, uh, and the time all come together, and that's when transmission occurs. So we, we work with that inner principle of Vajrayana. Did that answer your question, or were there something more that... Uh... Um, I guess that, that last little section sort of answered it mostly, because I'm, I'm more interested in the trip to Bhutan so mm -hmm. but that sort of gives me an idea so okay that was it. for Tibet yeah so for Bhutan I can mention in that context too that the, it's 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 the same where we go to some extraordinary places that where one can feel and experience the transmission and essence of Vajrayana according to 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 specific sacred places so that we will have uh, yeah both from western Bhutan and Paro and for those of you who you know were with us on our last trip in Bhutan, they know how Dr. Nita gave the transmission of our core uh, practice that we had there in this extraordinary temple, the Kujie Temple, where Baba Sambhava had left his imprint in solid rock. And so the power of transmission in these power places um, is very, very palpable. And on this next trip in Bhutan, which is actually going to be really entirely different, I mean, we'll be some of the same places we'll go to, but it's kind of going deeper than what we did even last year. And we go to the hidden land on the borders of Kembajong in the Lunse Valley, east of where we were on our last trip in Bhutan. And then we we follow an old um, pilgrimage and trade route and a yogi's path, essentially, from Lunse over to, to the Tang Valley in Bumtang. And there were particular places there that were known for the accomplishment of Salung and Tumo, the, the yogas of inner fire. So we'll be practicing in those places where very few people actually are able to, I mean, very few people from outside of Bhutan are able to reach anymore. Uh, and yet it's all very reachable. I mean, we, we have two nights, uh, a two night uh, trek, um, but nothing overly arduous. Uh, and uh, we have the opportunity, therefore, to practice at some incredible places where the 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 inner art, if you will, of Tumo was uh, brought to its some of their amazing stories there connected to some of the yogis from Tibet who both practiced and taught and transmitted Tumo in those places. So this is kind of the innermost essence of the of Kala Chakra, or sorry, of, of Chakra Samvara, as well of the Yogini Tantras in general, and as well as in the Dzogchen transmission. So that's our the way it will work in Bhutan as well as in in Tibet. We work with uh, the circumstances uh, in order to make the essence, essential practices of Vajrayana most uh, um, experiential. That answers that. Thank you. That 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 part of it's really appealing of the trip. Yeah. 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 And that's that's really what the essence. It's hard to describe, but that's the essence of what our journeys are. They're they're outer journeys to inner destinations, you could say. And so we work with the outer um, geography in order to, to reach these innermost states, ultimately. So they're inner, inner destinations, which are actually working about, uh, you know, states of mind and states of being that are often not part of our everyday experience and yet which are at the same time fundamental to, to the path of realization.
So to follow up, Ian, um, again, I, I'm, my name is Marcos. Okay. And to okay. follow up on the, that particular question, will, will do, we, do we meet any local practitioners of, in, of the path? Mm -hmm. In Bhutan in particular, uh, Tibet, it's trickier uh, just because of the way things have changed over the years. Uh, but of course, when the op any opportunity arises, we will meet with local practitioners in Tibet in particular. I'm hoping very much, I've already been in contact with our local representative over there to have us meet with an extraordinary female practitioner who spent nine years in retreat practicing Tumo uh, up at Yeshe Togyal's uh, Enlightenment Cave. And I've traveled with her on several trips into Pemaku, uh, as well as elsewhere in Tibet. And she spends most of her time in retreat. But uh, when she's, I've I've had her, uh, she's willing sometimes to emerge, uh, you know, it's part of practice actually to integrate with new circumstances. So very much hoping that she'll be able to, uh, to, to meet with us and join us in Lhasa. And then as we travel east, it really so much that we'll be meeting, there'll be many, many pilgrims and many practitioners who will serendipitously appear on the path, as it were. Um, and we, of course, work, that's why we work with circumstances. That's really the key. You know, the yeah. one of the key aphorisms in Tibetan Buddhism for pilgrimage is kasher lamker. Whatever arises, you bring it to the path. So in a way, there has to be this openness to to spontaneity and to working with circumstances rather than working with a kind of preset uh, idea of what's going to happen. So we, we work with things as they are, as they arise. And so, of course, that extends to, you know, if we happen to be in a situation where a great practitioner is is there and we can meet with them, uh, we will. And in Bhutan, it's much easier because there isn't, you know, some of the, the same constraints as we have in, in Tibet. And there will be meeting definitely with very yeah, prominent teachers and practitioners. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? We have, yeah, I think. No, was that a hand raised or that was just an adjustment? Anyway. Okay. As uh, as far as packing for the trip, I'm visualize. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to visualize you. There's the context of maybe thirty people on the Tibet trip. What kind of, you know, a lot of people have those big rolly bags, but it, it, will we need a backpack alongside of that? Like, will we? How do we move in our circles uh, together on these various trips, especially yeah. in Tibet? Yeah, good question and an important question. I think some of that's covered in the uh, the preparation and packing suggestions. But basically, and this is this is, and I'll explain about for the Bhutan trip as well. But for the Tibet trip, uh, you can bring a suitcase, you can bring a roller bag, whatever it is that you would travel internationally with. Um, that will go. Uh, there, there are a couple of considerations here. So normally, I'll just explain what I do. And then you can see what makes sense for you. I will come, you know, I come with a suitcase. Um, and I, in the bottom of my suitcase, I have a, 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 um, a lightweight little duffel, an extra bag. And I use that and I leave it at the hotel. I have a little locking combination lock on it. Things that I've tr had en route traveling, you know, through China up to the, up to Lhasa that I won't need until I actually am back in, uh, in Lhasa. I might choose to leave all of those you know, and very safely at our hotel in Lhasa until we get back to Lhasa. Possibly. A lot of people don't find that they have stuff to leave, but I kind of like to, to leave things when I can. Um, other than that, then that suitcase, and what I also bring, and it can be sometimes depending on how much you have, it could be a, a second uh, suitcase, or it might just be, uh, often what I do is I have a big suitcase. I have a collapsible, uh, larger duffel bag that I keep at the bottom of the suitcase, let's say like a Patagonia black hole bag or a North Face. These are kind of waterproof, very rugged uh, mm, duffel bags that mm -hmm. can be 
with, again, with a little lock on them. And the reason that's important to have a bag like that with you, the suitcase will go, we'll have along, we'll be in our vehicles uh, traveling across the Tibetan plateau, but our suitcases and our larger bags will be in a, in a luggage, in a, in a luggage van, a luggage truck, essentially. And, you know, they'll get jostled around on the roads. They'll get very dusty. So, you know, you don't want to bring some Louis Vuitton, Vuitton duffel, but you want to bring something that's very, you know, that's rugged. Um, and that'll be in the back and very safely in the luggage truck. And that luggage truck will reach our campsites uh, well before we do. And the ca- the tents will be set up and your bag will be there. Either you'll re- retrieve it from the, the truck um, and that's why I like to leave whatever I can behind in Lhasa so that I don't have too much in right. the truck. But then that bag will either be brought to your tent or you'll just retrieve it and choose a tent. They're different, you know, it works differently sometimes in different occasions. Um, then um, then when we get to, uh, and we do the circumambulation around Kailash, on the first day, just because the way the things have changed at the mountain now, the very first, now there's actually a road that the truck will follow. So it'll have the same model where all of your things will be brought to the base, to the north face of Kailash, where we'll spend two nights because it's an acclimatization day before we go over the, the Domala Pass. And then uh, at that point, the next day, your duffel bag will be put on a strapped onto the back of a yak. And that'll go off over the pass before we do. And so again, it'll be there at our camp waiting for you when you get there. Um, but this is why it's important not only to have, you know, a rugged duffel bag at that point that's waterproof. And uh, I mean, they'll still put tarps and on it if in case it starts to rain or something like that. But, it, you know, the, the ruggeder and more waterproof it is, the better. And then to have, as we put in the packing suggestions, a little digital uh, lock just to, you know, there could any, any just just to for your safety of mind to keep anything uh, valuable from from get, somehow getting lost on route. What we also do is before we start the um, the the trek around Kailash, you know, things like laptops and things like that, which I always bring on on the trips, but obviously we don't need to bring those around the mountain. And so there's a good hotel now uh, in Darchin where we'll be spending a night. And uh, I always have with me a small little um, roller bag, you know, the kind you would bring if you were just traveling on a plane with hand carry. And I put my computer in that and well padded and I just keep that at the hotel uh, very safely. And Mm -hmm. then therefore we want to really go around the mountain with as little as possible, just with our essential items. And then we get them, you know, three days later. So it, that way, it's in the same way we have the principle of of layering for for when you for dressing in a place like Tibet, you want to sort of layer in terms of your luggage as well. So having little, you know, extra little bags for this or that, things that you can leave behind here or there, and retrieve, you know, sooner or later, and that's why having a few little of these extra little small digital padlocks uh, is is useful. Just gives a lot of flexibility kind of a layering system, as I said, for packing as well. Thank you. Yep. In terms of money, should we change money in the Chengdu airport when we arrive, or should we change money in Lhasa uh, in the airport, or what would be the best way to have some pocket money? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, probably you'll need some money. Uh, you know, you'll have at least one night in Chengdu, uh, so you'll need some money there. Uh so probably changing some at the airport is a good idea. Um, and we'll see what the current, current, what I usually do is I change some money there and then I do the majority of changing uh, when I get to uh, to Lhasa. There are actually ATM machines in Lhasa, or at least there have been. They Some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, so it's better, it's better to bring cash. Uh, it's more reliable. But uh, I'll find out. I mean, again, I haven't been in a few years now since before COVID. So, uh, well, I'll find out what the current circumstances are with the ATM machines. But, you know, they were they worked. But if you have cr- crisp new bills, uh, it's much better. Uh, sometimes $100 bills will be rejected if they look too dirty and worn. So it's very important to have fresh currency. Uh, that's That's critical. But... Otherwise, it's no problem to change in Lhasa. We'll have time for that. So um, 
you know, we usually do that in cooperation with our tour operator there, you know, rather than everybody having to go to the bank, they just, you know, we know what the rate, they know what the rate is, we know what the rate is, and then they just change for us. So if it's a few hundred dollars at a time, uh, there's no problem at all. So, but do change enough to make sure you can get to your hotel in Chengdu and then back to the airport in the morning. Uh, and then otherwise you don't have to worry about anything until we get to Lhasa. And, you know, everything is covered, costs are covered on the trip, except for personal expenses. Um, but it's always good to have money along for, you know, people don't expect to be buying as much as they actually end up buying. And it's good to have small currency as little offerings at monasteries and temples and things like that. Thank you. And we'll need money also for, you know, the, the customary tips at the end of the trip for our for our guides and drivers, et cetera. All of that will give you further kind of uh, guidelines on uh, in an email. Um, hello, Ian. Thank you for thank you for all this information and the Zoom. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a question: how how long or how strenuous will the hikes be? Do we need yeah. to to train for altitude and like mm -hmm. train for those tracks? Do we have the opportunity of of walking? Yeah. Wednesday, Important question. And um, yeah, well, so on our trips, I, I've done more than 10, led more than 10 trips to Kailash. We've never had any kind of altitude problem uh, on any of them. And the reason is that that's why the trip is longer than it would have to be to just go to Kailash in itself. We spend three days acclimatized. Lhasa is almost 12,000 feet, so we're already quite high to begin with. But by spending three days there before we begin our drive, we're already acclimatizing. And then we go up quite gradually until we get to the base of Kailash, which is about 15,000 feet. And then we spend two nights at the north face of Kailash, which is a bit higher, but not all that much higher. And that allows us really to be fully acclimatized by the time we make. The only day that you could say a difficult hike of any kind is the day we cross over the 18,000 foot Domala Pass uh, into the, uh, you know, to the, the far side of the pass into Kailash. And that, that day, is it's very gradual going up, so it's only the altitude that makes it a little challenging. Um, but it's it's not a problem. And uh, as we've mentioned for some people, if they feel, you know, they're not up for that hike, um, they there's the option to take a horse up to the top of the pass. There are nomad boys there who are very ready to... Uh, happily to my mother just to give you an example pretty much the same itinerary we're following now we did in 2015 in tibet when my mother turned 80 years old and she insisted on going around the mountain which i told her from the outset she wouldn't be able to do but she did it without any problem but she she went on ahead with her with the horse and uh, i said mom the, the horse will only take you to the top of the pass not to won't take you down. She said, no problem. So she walked all the way down from the top of the pass before any of the rest of us could catch up with her, helped by all the, you know, Tibetan pilgrims along the way and was waiting there, you know, at the camp table drinking tea by the time I got there. And I, I had been racing all day to try to catch up with her. But the point is that, um, you know, there is that provision uh, if you suddenly feel like you just can't do it. We can always arrange a horse for you. Uh, just to go up to the pass and you walk down on the other side. Um, but it really, by that time, we have acclimatized well. And uh, I've really never, I've had people who've been at the North Face and they say, you know, there's just, they're really fearful. They don't think they're going to make it the next day and then they have no problem. So that's been my experience that everybody makes it and nobody is overly taxed by it so and that is because we really do spend enough time acclimatizing and yeah feel there are also breathing techniques as we'll as we will be introducing you to that really do help with acclimatization just as much as some of the medications like diamax do and they're finding that more and more for high altitude himalayan climbing expeditions that some of these particular breathing techniques can really help to oxygenate the whole the whole system and the whole way you pace yourself as we go up to the top of the pass, it's really a meditative breathing exercise. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't overly worry about that. As I said, my mother did it when she was 80 and didn't have any problem. 
And um, are we having a chance to to hike the other days as well? Yes. Or, uh, yeah. I wanted to mention that. So when we well, while we're in Lhasa, we will do an acclimatization hike on the second or third day. I think I think it's the second day uh, that we're there, and that's specifically to just make sure everybody's feeling okay and doing all right. And it also allows us, you know, the, one of the maxims for adjusting to altitude is called climb high, sleep low. So we will go up to a higher altitude and we will hike from uh, two, between two very important uh, sacred uh, sites, one of uh, a very notable hermitage, uh, then going over the, uh, to a nunnery and then on to Sarah Monastery. So that it's an easy hike, but it will allow everybody to really feel uh, what it's like to walk at altitude. It'll be over 12,000 feet. And uh, also to make sure that the gear you have is sufficient and it allows us to also see if there's anything that you might need that you didn't bring, in which case there are trekking shops in Lhasa where you can get pretty much anything you might have forgotten. You know, everything from boots to hiking poles, for example. Um, so... Yeah, so we have that acclimatization hike, uh, as well as, you know, a substantial amount of walking uh, in Lhasa in itself. Just going up to the Potala Palace is like climbing a mountain. <laughs> so, yeah, you'll get plenty of uh, walking there. And the same is true when we get to our next destination, Gyanse, walking through these extraordinary three-dimensional mandalas, the, kum the Gyanse Kumbum, you know, is like. So there's a lot of exercise um, as we're driving across that will prepare you for um, when we get to the the real to the mountain and then i should say also very specifically when we after the kailash kora we do what almost no other groups do which is continue west to the ancient uh, buddhist kingdom of uh, guge with tsaparang and toling extraordinarily beautiful important historically incredible cave paintings um early early tibetan buddhist art that's uh you know, unlike anything else we would have seen before then and really spectacular. And there's a lot of kind of hiking, walking there just to get up to the top of the Tsaparang, which is this great citadel and exploring the caves and tunnels and galleries of that, of that site. So there'll be plenty of walking, uh, but nothing overly strenuous. Um, it's just that one day, as I mentioned, going over, um, uh, going over the Domala Pass that, you know, can, is challenging, but not inordinately so. But I'm glad you brought up that question because that is a crucial, a crucial one. And a lot of people do get anxious about the, um, uh, you know, about whether they're in shape enough. Uh, and as I said, you know, having led many trips there, um, there's been a lot of anxiety that people have about that, but generally people do absolutely fine. And as I said, there is that provision uh, to either ride a, a horse or a yak, uh, as people do also choose to do to the top of the pass and then walk down. But you get less merit that way. <laughs> I mean, that's the conventional view, of course, is that, you know, the, the no pain, no gain. So if you're just sitting comfortably on a horse up to the top of the pass, then you're not going through quite the same internal struggle that uh, is part of the the beauty, the power, and the challenge of the pilgrimage itself, where you're walking through these charnel grounds and you leave a part of your clothing or a body part. There's a which we which we'll see. There are a couple. There are stages of kind of symbolic death and rebirth, leaving behind that which no longer serves, so that literally crossing over the Domala Pass is to pass through into a, you know, you've left your old karma, as it were, behind. And uh, there's, that's really why you'll see pilgrims prostrating all their way for sometimes a year, you know, from Eastern Tibet across the Tibetan plateau in order to reach Kailash, to go through that symbolic um, death rebirth, uh, death and rebirth in the sense of just leaving behind, which no longer serves the fears, the anxieties, the, the burdens, the traumas, uh, and then that incredible release that comes when you reach the past and you're kind of now in a new phase of your life where all that no longer serves has been left behind so uh, that's certainly certainly the way it works and uh, we will be also following that traditional model uh, 
as we will visit some sites again that are very seldom visited as we go around the mountain. There's a char there's a cremation ground, for example, a sky burial site where we go through a symbolic death and rebirth ritual. Um, there are waterfalls under which you know you have the option. They're freezing cold, but uh, again, they're purifying waterfalls. So there's a lot of very interesting things that are just right off the main track that people often don't uh, engage with. Uh, because for Tibetans, they're trying to do the whole, sometimes they do the whole three-day circuit in one day. So there simply isn't time. Uh, and then for for Westerners who visit the mountain, you know, they're just sort of focused on just getting from point A to point B. And you kind of miss the magic that's in between. So we will be focusing on the magic at all points of the trip. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I just want to say, we've been talking a lot about Kailash, but the same is very much true for, for Bhutan as well. And uh, particularly on this trip in Bhutan, where we'll be kind of going very much off the the normal beaten trail uh, of where tourists typically visit in Bhutan and encountering some aspects that are, yeah, very, very special indeed. Uh, Ian, I was thinking something additional. Uh, in Tibet, we will have the oxygen bags too, right? Yeah, very good. So yeah, very good. Exactly. You, Travel Ian. agency, they prepare the oxygen, the portable tanks, little bags. Yep. So if we will meet any problems with the high altitude, that's lack of oxygen. So therefore, we will have these portable oxygen bags, you know. Yep. So actually, so everybody will be super protected. If you can't walk, there will be yaks. If you can't breathe, there will be oxygen bag. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And if you want to stay there, there's a sky barrier. So every every yeah, everything everything is there exactly. Money, um, yeah, exactly. The regarding the money, if you have credit card, or AliPay, or Google Pay, or I, you know, iPhone Pay, so they are mostly electric money, electronic money, you know. They don't use cash much. So if you have credit card or Alipay, you know, the Apple Pay, these things work very well. Huh. And okay. uh, actually, many of us, we get really surprised. now. They are kind of cash free, you know, everything paid for mobile phone and credit card and so on. So if you have credit card or Apple Pay or Alipay, it should be fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except when you're tipping your porters when you're going around the mountain or paying for your yak. <laughs> yes, stuff. yes, yeah. yeah. So exactly. Having some cash is useful because uh, even at you know shrines and altars and the temples. But, yeah, but, yeah. That, but this is what I think you'll all be surprised by is that, you know, when you go to China, it's like so developed in a way. I mean, in a way, it's just much more technologically um, efficient, you know, than than America. <laughs> So it's sometimes surprising, you know, how how efficient the airports are and communications and the the hotel services, everything. It's 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 really, um, yeah, it's it's very up to date. Let's just say and and modern, cashless, for example. So yeah, so just you know, uh, having a variety of um, having cash, but also having credit cards, all of that is 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 critical, and. Uh, yeah, makes for an amazing journey. So we've gone past our hour, but that's only if uh, we're okay for the time being. But if anybody needed to go, please feel free um, uh, if you had only the hour. But otherwise we can, because we told some people we would stay around for another, well, until quarter past. So... Mm -hmm. We have about seven, eight minutes left if anybody did have more questions. Um, any Anything coming up? Uh, you're still formulating each group. How many people uh, so far are showing up for each of these uh, trips? Yeah, our, our plan is to have a, a group of no between 25 and 30 for each of the for each of the trips. That's our that's our intention. Uh, but we still do have a few, you know, we have a, you know, we're not going to be strict about that, but uh, but 30 is kind of our idea. 
Uh, so for some people who've just recently, just today, for example, there are a couple more people who are interested in joining. Um, so we, we do still have some room, but for the most part, each trip is already quite, um, uh, quite complete, but we did, they did say in Lhasa that they were hoping to issue all of the, um, uh, formal invitation letters, uh, once we had the groups fully, uh, formed, but then I, I had a talk with them yesterday and I said, look, we're still going to be accepting people up till the end of this month. And so they said, fine, we'll, we'll issue the letters for the number of people we have so far. And then, um, and then there are a few people, for example, who've co confirmed, committed, but not yet sort of paid in. And therefore we haven't, uh, asked, requested their formal letter to be issued. Um, so yeah, we'll have very good groups, but a very, a very good and workable size. So um, that's that's um, that's the plan. And and along with that same question, are they separate vans we roll in? Okay. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, so this uh, buses, like what are we looking at? Yeah. Okay. So there's no, no, no. It's important. So there's a new regulation, as there often are in China. Uh, for a group in Tibet can no, cannot be more than 15 people, but you can have, um, so we will have, we are formulating, uh, we have already two groups basically, and those groups, everybody will be staying in the same hotels, eating together, traveling together. The only place where that becomes an issue, and it may not even be an issue is when we go, we have to drive through a few check posts. And it may be that people who are designated with a particular group with a particular guide will all be on one bus of 15 people uh, as we as they do a customary uh, check at the check post. That's the only time when it becomes even something that we would experience um, as uh, anything at all. But it, it's a sensible way in which the, the, the Chinese government keeps track of groups, keeps track of people. Um, and it doesn't mean that a group has a, a 15 has its own guide. Um, but again, it doesn't really affect our experience. In the past, they've had another rule, which was extremely problematic. And it would be certainly in our trip where you couldn't have a group that was mixed nationalities. So I had one group with like six groups because we had six different nationalities, you know, the American. <laughs> and so they, everybody had to sort of gather according to their their their. Um, their country of origin uh, when we went through certain check posts. That was, I think they realized how impractical that was. And then they scrapped that one. And this is the current one that's in vogue at the moment, but it doesn't really affect anything. It's just affects us in terms of putting, how we put the groups together and all of that. But our experience. And so be, it, it's be vans or buses like uh... it, it, a bus. Uh, well, it's a bus, it's okay. sort of a luxury bus and the bus is by far. And this is what people don't realize. Sometimes we've had buses and then we've had land cruisers. Uh, the buses are far more comfortable ultimately to travel in than the land cruisers are. The land cruisers can be slightly faster, but when you're in the bus, it's much more, there's more interaction. There's loudspeaker, we have music, we have, we have talks there's a lot more engagement uh when we have a group you know with 15 people on one vehicle rather than three or four three basically in land cruisers which used to be the norm going to kailash when it was a terrible road uh where you had to kind of go you know at full speed with a land cruiser through rivers and sometimes you know literally swept away sometimes and jeeps uh, but now the road is very smooth and it has cut the driving time down between lhasa and um and kailash in half easily because it used to be just this unbelievable washboard with but now there are bridges and and asphalt where there wasn't before so traveling by bus is very comfortable and certainly more convivial so the one thing we would encourage everybody to bring though because sometimes the drives are long we, uh, to bring bring some good music to share on the for the bus rides that's important <laughs> uh so on occasion we'll we'll want that we'll bring we'll bring some of our 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 own uh we have some things in mind for you on the bus but it, it doesn't hurt to bring and we'll share more of that in a, in in an email and things like that as the trip comes closer thank you but thank you for the question yeah Anything else? 
we would just say, since there are kind of a, a lot of new names and faces here, that anybody who hasn't, um, we have about, you know, I think it's close to 25 people already signed up for Tibet. Um, and we do want to kind of cap it at 30. So if you have not signed up or you haven't um, kind of registered, but have been thinking about it, we urge you to do so right away <laughs> because we, we, uh, we will be capping the trip. We've sort of said now, they've all, I, again, as per our conversation with our local representative, they're, you know, they're eager just to have a kind of, they also need to know uh, how many people want single rooms and single tents, how many people are sharing double, um, double accommodations, twin accommodations, all of that. So if you've been kind of on the fence about um, about this trip in particular, uh, with with Bhutan we have a it's it's you know it's a bit later so we have more of a buffer there. But for the Kailash trip, we really urge anybody who's interested in that trip to let us know right away by email, so that we can put you down as confirmed. We had a few people who said, oh, they were always interested, but then I sent out a few emails yesterday, and now they've sent their. We really need your passport photos as quickly as possible in order to get those official letters issued. And then we just need to know for sure that uh, those who've said they're confirmed, but, you know, haven't paid a deposit. And at this point, it wouldn't be paying a deposit, it'd be paying the full amount because this, at this point, we need to, um, we need to send money right away to, uh, to Lhasa, uh, which is the customary way it works, both for both trips in Tibet, as well as trips in Bhutan, where the money has to be paid in advance. So please do get in touch with us right away. Uh, if you're interested uh, in either trip, but in particular right now for for the Tibet trip. So if, if um, Dr. Nita, do you have any other comments or thoughts before we have another gap, you know, in a meeting in a few weeks? Yeah. I think uh, that's good. And uh, yeah, so as you talked already about the teachings, so in Kailash, you know, according to Hinduism is the spiritual palace of Shiva. We will, you know, cover that about uh, Shiva, the holy mountain, Shiva Lingam. Actually, yeah, we talk so much about Shiva Lingam. Kailash is the role model there. Organic yeah. Shiva Lingam, right? <laughs> and then the Yoni is the lake. So I think it's, it's according to Shivaism or Hinduism, we are really going to the yeah the we'll original place of at how yeah. these two traditions have come together there and really exactly and fertilized. Yeah. And tantric Buddhism is the yeah chakra samvara as you explained, and especially we explore about Vajrabadi. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. Like how how we yeah how we understand how we map inside you know mm -hmm. where are the locations of our joy you know twelve types of joy so some tantra they talk sixteen and according to chakra samara is talking about twelve types of joys mm -hmm. and which corresponds to twelve zodiac signs twelve months so there will be yeah study of the Vajra body and astrology, secret geometry, secret geomancy. So many things are lapping. Mm -hmm. so and all of that, as you say, is you know, kind of preparation for the inner yeah. body yogic practices of Tummo, you know, igniting yes, those yes, yeah, places exactly. within our own yeah. Vajra body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, it will be a it will be a journey of more than a journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So it's as we said, sort of an outer journey to a secret destination to a secret destination, which is our own realizing our full potential. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So we'll uh, keep you all posted. We'll send out another Instagram and we'll also send out emails to everybody currently who's on the list uh about a um you know, within a month's time or so, when we'll have a session that focuses really specifically, as Dr. Nita just outlined, on the um, this idea of the, you know, what what really is the heart of the of the Chakrasambara tradition and its outer, inner, and secret practices. 
and giving you some also uh, initial practices that you can begin with um, as we begin the journey. So, so if that's it for now, unless anybody has any other burning question, we'll we'll end there. I have and, one um, more really quickly. Yeah, and sure, Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. If you have any um, recordings of of practices that we might um, start doing, or I would appreciate it very much, like meditations mm -hmm. or things like that, it would be very helpful. Please. Okay, Dr. Need and I can discuss that, and then uh, then uh, let everybody know what what might be a good foundational practice for yeah this this period now a few months before the trip begins that we can then build on as the trip unfolds. Okay. So if that's that, then uh, that was a very good question to end on. Uh, well, we've taken note of everything and we'll get all you this material to you as soon as possible. And just again, want to emphasize that, you know, it's been a lot of sort of with the two trips happening simultaneously. If there's any doubt, uh, if any of you, you know, are going on both trips or one trip or the other um, and you haven't uh, confirmed please let us know right away so that we can kind of uh, formalize the two, the two groups uh, as soon as possible. So thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Uh, Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Hope see you soon. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Dr. Nida. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone.